Hello, I'm Jude Scott and today we're going to be painting watercolour roses. I've got roses from my garden, um, beautiful old-fashioned roses, David Austin's beautiful fragrance. Um, here are the paints I'm going to use. I always like to use Holbein paints. They're very finely ground, very intense pigments. Um, it's Oriole and Yellow was the first one. That one is Mars Violet. Um, there I've got cobalt blue, I use the 290 and I've got some raw sienna plus I did use some um, alizarin crimson. That's a very wide brush, I love wide hake brushes. I've got my rigger brush which has got a very fine point and holds loads of water. I've got a um, calligraphy brush which I love to use. What else have I got? I've got a block here. It's really important to have something to dry your brush on and get just the right amount of water to pigment ratio. It's probably one of the most tricky things in watercolour. This is my little palette. I take it everywhere with me. It's great for travel, very tough. Um, I have dropped it many times and it doesn't seem to affect it. Always give your paints a good spray before you start painting. It's got lot, this one has got lots of mixing wells, it's got a flat palette and if I'm plain air I can always turn it around where I've got my thumb and the two big wells there have got, um, a, hold a large amount of water so it's perfect for everything I need. Today I thought I would stretch my paper. It's very very tight on a, just an old um, oil canvas frame. I've sealed the wood so that the wood tannins can't soak into the paper and they won't be able to cause foxing in later times. So always seal any wood that your paper comes in contact with so that it protects it for um, the future. So I've made a start and I've wet this area here that I'm going to do um, the pe uh, petals. So I started with some yellow, aureole and yellow, and I've dropped in some alizarin crimson. And it's quite wet there. As you can see, the paint is flowing over the surface of the paper. So it's quite difficult to get to the stage where you can do this with confidence, but it's well worth practicing, even if you just practice doing single petals so that you can mix colors. Um, it's a bit like doing a graded wash really. You start with one colour and while it's still wet you can drop other colours in and you can get them to swirl around or go where you want. They will only go where there's wet paper. So I've just mixed up some um, alizarin crimson and some aureole and yellow and I'm just touching it to the paper. Um, if it's a little bit bright or not bright enough you can always drop some more water in and just drag it down to where you want it to go. It's just really like drawing with your paintbrush. So to get that to bleed out into the petal I've added, I'm adding a little bit more pigment with in alizarin crimson. It's a little bit strong for what I want so I can smooth that out into another area just by dragging a wet paintbrush along and then gradually getting one area of that petal to merge in with what is um, the area that the petal's curling over. We're just continuing this to shape the rose. This is um, quite a complex painting because there's layers and layers and you can't rush it. So just be prepared to spend some time if you want to do roses and paint along. So I'm just softening that top edge of the rose. I think roses are all about soft and hard edges. You can paint them with all soft edges, but it is really good to have a mixture of or a combination of soft and hard edges. The pigment there I'm just dragging down from that pool of pigment just a soft area and filling out that next petal with water 
So the paint will only go where the paper's wet, so it will creep up into that wet area and give a lovely soft edge. So there's a lot of water on that paper, um, and I've stretched it over this frame simply because it's just something different to do, and I like to paint on a very tight surface sometimes. Usually I don't stretch my paper at all. I just paint because I like to be able to pick the sheet of paper up and tip it upside down. And I find, unless I've stretched it the day before and it's dried, um, I'm too impatient. I just think, no, I can't be bothered doing that. And I like to just plunge in and paint on a sheet of paper. I think because I usually paint a lot of wet in wet and paint quite quickly, the whole paper stays quite wet all over. It's only when you get areas of wet and areas of dry that your paper will buckle. So I knew this particular painting was going to take quite a long time. I've done it over two afternoons. So I needed something that would stay very taut. I didn't want it to buckle. So the rose petals so far are just a mixture of warm and cool. Um, this particular rose is the most beautiful warm pink. It's got quite a lot of yellow in it. So I'm not that worried about replicating the colour exactly, but I'm more about interested about um, producing the best painting I can of a bunch of roses. Now, I'll let you in on a secret. I actually was pruning the roses, and this was the only flower left on the bush. So I've taken three different views with my camera of the same rose, and before it died, I've got a photo of it going to the left, one looking down and one looking up. So you can paint a whole bunch of roses, or a group of roses, three in this case, from just the one specimen. So you don't have to go out and buy a great bunch of roses. You can just use one. This area here was the centre of the rose. And because it's quite deep within inside the rose, you need to be able to have different tones in your paper, different tones in the rose to get that look of a three-dimensional rose. Because we've only got a piece of flat paper, so how do you make the centre of the rose look further away than the edges of the rose that are close to you. Well, it's all done um, not by magic, but with tone, tonal values. So if your centre of the rose or the centre of any flower is cooler and darker than the outsides, it will recede back just that fraction. And you'll see as this rose develops, I'll get that probably to be a bit darker because the paint is quite wet and that will fade as it dries. So watercolour fades probably 10 to 20 percent depending on the brand of pigments that you use and as I said I always like Holbein pigments, they're very very finely ground. I think they're the finest ground that are produced for watercolour and they give a lovely even wash. Um, you can get them to granulate of course if you want but, and they've used no animal products making their paints. So you only need a small amount of their paint, but it will dry lighter. So I tend to paint quite a bit darker um, than I want. And then I use a damp paintbrush to drag out that paint onto the paper. So, I'm now just sketching the edges, the recesses of those petals. There's lots and lots of petals on a David Austin rose. So then just lightly sketching those in and softening that with a little bit of water, just a small amount, so that I can then get the surrounding pigment to flow into those petals where I want it to go. Just adding some tonal depth there. And 
still just sculpting, kind of sketching that rose with my paintbrush. I have drawn them in very lightly with pencil, so it's a little bit hard to see with a drawing. Any pencil marks that show, um, all you need to do is get an eraser and when the paint is completely dry, and I do mean completely dry, um, lightly go over with it and the graphite from your pencil will actually rub off even if it's underneath watercolour. So that's if you've only used a very um, light pencil, light touch with your pencil. I like to sketch in uh, with a 2B, a very fine diameter, very small diameter 2B pencil. And I really like the mechanical pencils because you don't have to worry about sharpening them. You just push out a little bit more lead and it, because it's fresh it always gives you a nice line. I don't know why but if pencils, if sometimes I do use them, if they're freshly sharpened they're much easier to get a beautiful line with than if they've been sitting in your pencil box for some time. I don't know if anyone else finds that but that seems to be the case for me. So this rose, this is actually the bottom of the rose and the bottom as in it's closest to the ground and it was further away from the light source so it's darker down here so I'm using quite strong tones in the paint, alizarin crimson with a little bit of cobalt blue and a touch of aureole and yellow and I'm going to make those areas there quite dark because there's no light on those edges. A little bit of light on that one but underneath the rose it is in just a very soft shadow. So I'm just merging those paints and it's with a just damp brush. No water on that brush. It's so important to keep your brush with just the right amount of water. Too much and you'll flood that colour and it will just run everywhere. Not enough and you'll end up with hard edges where you don't want them. So now just restating some deeper colours. You can see that the centre of this rose is still quite damp because those colours are bleeding in. They're not just sitting as a sharp line on the paper. They're mixing with the other paper that was already there. Now because the petal, um, I'm sorry the camera's not, uh, that's better. Um, because that petal is almost dry, the shine has gone off it the paper. If I get my rigger brush with just some water, see how I can open up some channels, a bit of texture in that petal. Um, you can also, you could drop colour in there if you wanted. I'll do that later, but just at the moment I'm just going to drop in some water, just paint in some lines just with water, adding a little bit of pigment here so that you get that look of um, some crinkles in the leaves, in the petals rather and just a bit of texture. Just looks to me a bit more interesting than one flat look for the petal. Just picking up a little bit more alizarin crimson. And don't forget to paint in the direction that the petal is folding into the centre of that rose. In the image that I took there was quite a bit of light on those top edges, the top petals of the rose, so I left them at this stage unpainted. I can always come back and restate some colour in there if it gets, if it looks like it's going somewhere that I don't want it to go. So start off light, you can always go darker. With another wash over the top, if it's too bright, you could always put a cooler wash 
over your rows. But if you start too dark too soon, um, you don't have any room left to move. So there's lots of just little minor adjustments to do in there. At the moment with the brush I'm just adding some water to that to try and actually produce cauliflowers in the petals for some texture. Like I did with opening up channels in that top petal. Now it's dried a little bit more so I'm going in now with quite dark a centre. I keep referring back to my image and the centre of the rose was very very dark even though it was a very pastel rose. So really look at the subject when you're painting them and think how dark is that on a scale of 1 to 5 if 5 is the darkest colour almost, almost say a black. How dark is the centre of your rose or the centre of the flower and how light are the lightest areas of the petals. Sometimes they are white, but most often they are very pale, maybe a one and a half, or just a number one tonal value. Um, usually there's a lot of mid-tones, both warm and cool. You need warm and cool, but sometimes those centres, when you judge them against a tonal value swatch they're about a four or a four and a half and of course if you're painting dark red roses there are areas of roses <clears throat> where the darkest tone is almost black so this dark center will dry a lot lighter so I'm just constantly referring back to the image to try and get that center looking something like the actual flower. Just now using that, the tip of the brush to readjust some areas, going around the edges of the petals and painting in the shadows. It's quite interesting to see how in a few moments this will look like it's recessed into the flower and it will start to develop a three-dimensional look. In the future I will be doing some very abstract florals, um, very impressionist, but a lot of you love to paint quite realistic flowers so um, I hope you're enjoying this and I hope it gives you some um, food for thought and hopes you uh, helps you on your journey to paint some roses. I'm very lucky I've got roses in my garden so I don't have to go very far to find something to paint. I've always got roses or other flowers but uh, many people are not so lucky. They live in units or flats and have to actually go and buy them. But always take your camera with you because um, whenever I'm out and about I take my camera and I have some fantastic images to draw from. I've got peonies and sunflowers and um, lots and lots of wonderful flowers that I can always find something new and interesting to paint. So again now just painting in some of those deeper areas of the petals trying to get a look of three dimensions happening.
So when you're watching the video, you might just decide, I'll just paint, have a go at painting just part of one of these flowers. But I do hope that you um, enjoy watching and um, that you have fun painting along. I've put some background in. Um, I don't usually do that at this stage of the painting, but I did in this particular one because I wanted to judge just how dark to make the background in relation to the flower. A lot of painting is about relationships of the background to the foreground, relationships in colours, warm and cool. And so I, in reality, the background in the photograph was quite dark. So that's the only way you have to make light areas of a painting stand out is to paint really dark behind them. So here I'm using a mixture of phthalo blue and some uh, Mars violet. I'm also going to drop in some quinacridone gold in a moment. But there's a lot of water on this paper. And because the paper is absolutely dead flat, laying flat on my bench top, it's not going anywhere. It's not pooling. It's not uh, well, it's not pooling because it's stretched tight, and it's not running down the page because um, it's horizontal, flat on the table. So before it dries, it's really important. If you don't want hard edges on your flower or your subject that you're painting, now's the time to soften them before that paint dries because. You don't want it looking like it's an object that's been stamped onto your paper, which is how it will look unless you have a variation of edges. Um, keep some soft and have some hard, but mostly soft. And then that will take your eye to the subject rather than to the hard edges of your floral work. So now I'm dropping in some quinacridone gold. The paper that I'm painting on is dry, so you can see I've got skips happening on the paper. But I'm really loading my brush up with other pigment and dropping that in to the gold. So I don't really have to paint much in the background. The water carrying the pigment and the water is actually painting the painting for me. So look, make it easy for yourself. Don't feel you have to do incredibly complex backgrounds. You don't need a complicated background. Um, most of the time with flowers, you can get away with something very simple. So here's a, oh, that was a quick image of the next flower that I'm going to paint process is exactly the same as doing the first rows. Put in a little bit of um, warm and cool pink with the alizarin crimson and aureolan yellow in the top section of the flower and now I'm putting some alizarin crimson with just a touch of cobalt blue. I use cobalt 290 in Holbein. So I'm just blocking that in the centre of the rose. You can see in the background there, in the top corner of the rose, um, with all of that water, I've got some cauliflowers. I just dragged a damp rigger brush through and I got some lovely cauliflowers there just to break up the very flat look of the background. It could be stems, it might be sparkles of light coming through. It could be anything at all really, but you don't want something that's too busy to take away from the flowers because they're quite busy themselves. So I'm just dropping in some aureole and yellow and then some alizarin crimson and it's permanent alizarin crimson that I'm using. When you're using alizarin crimson, always make sure, check the label, make sure it's permanent. 
because some alizarin crimsons are not permanent. So alizarin crimson, it is an expensive pigment, but it gives you the most beautiful pinks. So if I wanted to make a red, a real scarlet red out of this alizarin crimson, I would just drop in some aureole and yellow. And it makes the most wonderful, vibrant scarlet. Or I can get it to be a very, very cool pink just by watering it down. And I could drop in the tiniest amount of cobalt blue and I would have a very cool pink. So it's a very versatile colour. That's why I like it. So I always paint with pretty much a limited palette and in the background I always use the same colours that are in the flowers except of course I have used um, phthalo blue and some quinacridone gold in the background for the strength to make that really dark in the background. So again here I'm using um, water just to get those different petal edges to merge together and flow over the paper. The first rose is going to be my focal point, so there will be more detail in that one than there will be in the two subsequent roses. So I don't need as much detail in them. And you often find that once you get going, um, it all starts to happen and you get quite a buzz. It's fantastic when you think, I think this is working. And of course, at other times when it's not working, you think, hmm, this is hell. It can be just so difficult. So here I've finished um, two of the roses, and now I'm on to the top rose. This was the one I was painting earlier, and I'm now just redefining the dark areas in the rose. You can see on the bottom rows I put some veins in those petals. I might soften some of those out, I might not. And there's a couple of very white areas of petal there. I will wash a very pale wash over those because I don't want them to stand out quite as much as that. Those hard edges are too disturbing. So just dropping some yellow in to warm up that center of the rose and I'll drag that out to the edge of the rose because that was quite in shadow there wasn't much light happening in there so take your time you don't have to rush this is one of the paintings that you can paint section by section. You don't have to sort of complete the whole thing in, you know, half an hour. You can take a couple of afternoons to do it, or you could take a whole week to paint. Um, it depends how much time you've got, but truly the best thing to do is to paint every single day. If you want to get better, practice as often as you can, even if you only get 10 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day, when you come home from work with a cup of tea or coffee, take it to where your painting space is. Um, if you're lucky, you've got somewhere set up where you can just sit and paint. And watercolour is fantastic because you can just get up and leave it. And you can go back to it when you're ready. Not like acrylics, you've got all that cleaning up to do. Oil painting, you've got lots of cleaning up to do. Watercolours, no, you can just, just leave it and come back when you're ready. So there is absolutely no substitute <clears throat> for brush miles. So the more you paint, the better you will become. I kind of liken it to a concert pianist or an opera singer or a great guitarist. No, nobody who does anything really, really well is doing it because they're a genius. They've all um, worked very hard to make it look very easy. But then 
when you're doing something that you absolutely love, it's not really hard work. I find I could paint every day, nearly all day, and just get up every now and again and do a bit of gardening. That would be perfect. So just going around, um, doing little bits to the edges while some of that central area of the flower dries. You just have to know when the right stage is to drop some more pigment in. So long as the paint, um, so long as the paper is uh, wet, and wet is almost shiny. In fact, it is. If you've got shiny paper, it's still shiny with the water that you've put on or the fresh pigment, you can drop colours into that. So you could have wet pink and you can drop yellow in, <clears throat> you could drop more water in, you could drop more red in, any colour and you could just keep adding and adding. But once it gets to the stage where the shine has gone off the paper, don't touch it because you will only get ugly marks that you're not happy with. And if you keep poking your brush into colour, with more pigment when you should stop, that's another danger because you'll end up with an overworked area. It's really important in watercolour to paint an area and then leave it. I guess it's easy to say that, but if you're just starting out, it, it takes quite a bit of courage just to put the paint down and leave it. I think I've seen more paintings ruined through being overpainted than underpainted. So that's still a bit damp in that centre section, so I wasn't happy, so I was just lifting that out with a damp like a damp brush, a brush that was really dry actually. I'm just restating some of the colour here, just washing that in. While that dries a little bit, I can drag a bit of colour into that next petal. Again, just adding a little bit of definition there for the shape of the rose. It can be quite tricky because you want to make it look like it's the centre of the rose um, because these old fashioned roses have almost like a cup in the centre and the petals can form a bit of a saucer around the outside of the cup. But you don't want a hard edge all the way around so you've got to sort of Make sure that central section has got some lost and found edges or again it will look like it's been stamped on the paper. Now I've added quite a bit of cool into that petal that is underneath the first rose and now I'm blocking in just water with my wide brush because I want to flood some more background in here and finish off the painting. So I've mixed up Mars Violet and Ultramarine with, and thrown in a little bit of Alizarin Crimson. It's really just a very very dark version of the shadows in the rose. I have wet the paper as you saw so I can then just drag the brush around and cut in to behind the petals where I'd like it to be dark. Um, now that I've done that, 
I can come in over the top. I've mixed up some uh, quite strong quinacridone gold into that purple and added a bit more blue. So I've got a green using the same colours. And I'll just drag that <coughs> around the paper um, because it's wet. It's merging beautifully. The colours are running into each other. Um, I've used quinacridone gold in some of the other background and it's echoing the yellows in the rose even though that was aureolan yellow. I'm using loads of wet pigment here but it's very strong pigment and it's often an area of difficulty that I see um, with people painting backgrounds for the first time. They start with the pigment way too weak. You've got to have it really, really strong. As you can just see the corner of my paint box there. It's very hard to position that so you can see it in the painting. But it, this paint is really thick, very, very strong. So if you start with very thick, strong pigment, you can always wash it, dilute it down with more water if you're not happy. But if you start too weak, it's very hard to add strong pigment to a watery mix. So I'm just fading out those edges there now before they dry too hard. And have a plan in mind when you decide to put your background in. What colour do you want your background? Do you want it very dark? Do you want it a warm background? Do you want it to be a very cool background? And have big puddles of your paint mixed up before you start. This painting is 40 by 50 centimetres, so um, it's quite a large area. So I have got probably two tablespoons of each pigment mixed up ready. Um, and I very rarely have pigment left over. You can always add a bit more in, um, but there's nothing more annoying than having to stop halfway through and mix up more pigment. So there's a bit more ultramarine going in. I need that a bit darker down there. It, I know it's going to fade because it's very wet. So the paper is um, Saunders Waterford um, and it's 300 grams and it's uh, a medium pressed paper so it's not a rough and it's not hot pressed. Hot pressed, if you are not sure of how to remember papers, hot pressed is like you've ironed, ironed something with a hot iron. It's pressed really smooth and it's very flat surface. Medium pressed is often best for um, people who don't have a lot of experience with painting or you just love the feel of a medium pressed paper. It's probably the most popular watercolour paper. Rough is brilliant for landscapes, it's brilliant for all sorts of things um, and I actually prefer to paint on either hot pressed or rough. I don't often use um, medium pressed but at the top edge here you can see that it's got quite a bit of texture in that paper and the paint will settle in the hollows of either rough paper or medium pressed and give a really pleasing effect to the background. So I don't want hard edges especially with a very dark background so get a brush wet it and then make it as dry as you possibly can. Squeeze it dry in a towel and then go back and push those petals out into the background. I've got another brush here. I'm just going to do the same with that. This brush is a one inch flat brush with um, I think acrylic. Yeah, it's acrylic bristles and they're a bit stiffer than the brush I was using before, the big wide hake brush. And you can get 
a little bit more paint lifted off. That's another reason I really enjoy using Holbein paints because they lift off beautifully on every surface of paper. The only one, of course, that you will have trouble lifting off is any of the uh, staining colours, for example, phthalo blue or Prussian blue or Windsor blue. They're very staining. Indigo is also very difficult to lift off because that has phthalo blue in it. Um, but most of them, I find with Holbein, lift off beautifully. As you can see, I can almost get that back to white paper, or very, very pale. So that's exactly what I want when I'm painting. And because the paper is very wet, I'm having to go around and lift it off again because it's seeping into the damp paper where I've lifted off. Just a little bit more. Okay, so that's getting very close to being finished. It's still drying and there's still water pooling in the bottom left hand corner of that painting. So I'm just going to use a damp piece of kitchen paper as an eraser and see how that paint is just lifting off the paper. Fantastic. So it's almost dry. I've got enough happening in the background, um, I think it's finished. A couple of marks there. Just with a rigger brush. You can see how light areas are appearing and I'm dropping in some quinacridone gold. Holbein quinacridone gold and there just some water just to balance the top right hand corner has got some lifted out areas some lighter areas so I've just balanced it by doing that on the opposite corner. A couple of marks there maybe it could be a leaf abstracted sort of leaf Okay, I think I'll just take a bit of that wet that puddle of paint out. You can just use the end of a natural bristle brush and just suck up the capillary action will just suck that paint up off the paper for you. So that's a mix of warm and cool petals, light and dark background, just a bit of a sprinkle of water on that drying background and you can just see little halos are appearing and that can look like light coming through the vegetation behind the roses. So we'll see what that looks like when it's drying. Okay, now here's the finished painting. It's um, at the moment there's more speckles across that than it should have because that's it. Um, so you can see it's a balanced painting. Um, I've got light and dark, warm and cool. The petals have form. Um, I think I've managed to achieve the right mix without putting overworking areas and some of the background is very very calm and soft and some of it's got a little bit of detail but most of the detail is in the floral work in the roses so look thanks for watching I really hope you've enjoyed it um, if you like to subscribe to the channel uh, any updates and there will be new videos coming out I will notify you and uh, you can always leave a like if you wish. Thank you very much.